I would like to uh, ask Jeroen, who also prepared a great talk about uh, everything that he's learned from a former uh, career, so to speak. And uh, please uh, take us uh, on the hand on finance and banking. Yeah, thanks. So, 20 years ago, um, I was working at Citibank. I was in, in California. I was actually leading um, their, their innovation lab. Um, uh, we were very proud because we were the first ones to launch internet banking. And we had this idea, okay, if we do internet banking, it not only provides a better service to our customers, it will actually give us a much better insight in what our customers really need. And uh, of course, I was all excited about it, but then a lot of people told me, you know, all great ideas, but you guess, you know, nobody will ever do their banking on the internet. And strangely enough, this is the discussion I'm having today. So I'm, of course, all excited about what we can do for healthcare because it's way more impactful than what we ever done in finance. Um, but I'm getting into the same discussions. I say, well, it's really important that we collect data about the patient so that we can better help the patient. And we have to do it in the cloud because it's a great place to bring data together, to analyze data. And then actually we can share it and people look at me and say, no, 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 we're, we're never gonna put patient data in the cloud. It's privacy, security. And I said, yeah. But it has such a huge impact on, on, on care. You know, it can really help us create those better outcomes. So what I want to start with is how it evolved, what happened in financial services, which is undergoing the next disruption while we're still you know, working on our first. So the reason I put up this picture is because today, um, as I said earlier, we have quite a historic event. Um, we're bringing, um, we're IPOing our lighting business, which is interesting because that's how Philips got started 125 years ago. So actually the first stock exchange where we IPO'd our lighting company was here in Amsterdam. So the first stock exchange in the world was here in Amsterdam. And actually you see a picture there where people traded shares in um, one of the most innovative companies at that time, um, our uh, East India company. So actually a lot of people put their money into funding exploration out to, um, to Asia. Now, when I joined uh, Citibank in, in the early 90s, um, I went to the stock exchange. And there you had the guys with the blazers, you know, all the smart guys, and they were shouting and making trades, and they looked each other in the eye and said, okay, I understand what you want, I understand the, where we are in the market, so let's make this trade. Then, a couple of years later, you know, the physical stock exchange started to disappear. So even in Amsterdam, we don't have a physical stock exchange anymore. Even you, today, you can buy Philips Lighting shares, you do it, you know, entirely automated. Um, there is no physical place to trade it. Um, so what we've seen is the emergence of advanced visualization, where traders actually could look at very complex information, very complex financial information, and based on that information, make a trade. Now, today, most of the trading is algorithmic. Al algorithmic. Why? Because they find out that advanced visualization is not sufficient. Advanced visualization doesn't allow you to deal with the complexity of all the financial information simultaneously. Now, I know the financial system is extremely complex, but each of us, each of us individually is a way more complex system than the entire financial system. So I think it gives us some ideas about how we should think about healthcare. And I also remember around the same time we started working on internet banking, that's when the international payment systems were emerging. And that's why I kept referring back to the fact that you can travel around the world, just like what we're doing here today, we travel around the world in 24 hours. If you would physically travel around the world, you would be able to pay with one card or even your phone in any restaurant, in any hotel, 
at the airport, anywhere. And while you pay, actually, a request is going up to the, uh, the server of your bank and it will authorize that transaction. So we've completely standardized the payment system. We have created a standard for devices so anybody can create a point of sale device to securely exchange this information. This information. I think it's a very important I think it's notion because today you can travel around the world but nowhere on that trip will you be able to access all your relevant health information. So I think the other thing we learned, and 20 years ago, we started saying, hey, we have 50 million customers in, in Citibank. What if we start organizing our services around the needs of those patients? So what if we look at our uh, customers as a set of people with similar needs? We should and could do the same in healthcare. So we can start looking at our patients and identify their needs and then optimize around their needs and measure the success of that uh, approach in the outcomes of those patients. So what we're seeing is that not only can we do this in healthcare, because what you see on the left is this trading station, what you see in the middle is actually a cockpit. And in this cockpit, the same principle applies. Very complex information about the plane, about the environment, about the trip is summarized on a screen, which is entirely context sensitive. And what you see in the next slide is actually a telehealth center. And I don't like the word telehealth center because it kind of reminds me of last century. But it's basically a central care hub where you simultaneously can look at thousands, millions of patients Complex information about those patients will stream in and the algorithms will automatically prioritize those patients in need of care. So if you're looking at a thousand very sick patients at home, at any time only 10 will need some form of intervention. So how can we make sure that we do the right intervention at the right time? We accumulate our knowledge of those patients, but we also accumulate the knowledge about how we can provide the best care and what would be the best intervention at that time. That's stuff we're starting to do today. But it's not general practice. It's not general practice because we're still looking at a system that's largely physical. You go to the GP in the next uh, street and then he refers you to a hospital which is um, in town. So we're not necessarily optimizing care according to location, according to excess of expertise. Now, at the same time, we're collecting all this very interesting information about you. So we can start creating very, very, very rich profiles. So what you see is the pink picture is actually um, a pathology. Uh, we take somebody is diagnosed with cancer, we can take some tissue, which we can do non-invasive. We can just go in with a catheter, smart catheter, pick up a piece of tissue. And instead of using a microscope, we now use digital pathology, a digital microscope. The digital microscope will create a map and a map of the cancer. We can actually zoom in just like we do on Google Maps, but it can automatically interpret those images so it can give you the relevant biomarkers which tells you about the cancer. But we also want to understand how that cancer sits in the full autonomy. So has it grown? Has it, has it moved around? Is there a specific pathway of this cancer? And more importantly, do we know what is the genetic code that drives that cancer? Because cancer is an illness of cells. And the way um, a cancer evolves is written in the genetic code. So now we can anatomically analyze the cancer, we can look at the cell structure, we can actually read the DNA, and we become very precise. That will help us make the right diagnosis, but it will help us to create a very precise um, treatment because because of your genetic code and the genetic code of the cancer, we know what, where you have the highest chance of success. But we can then link it to you as a person. Because all of this is great, but if half of the population don't take the medication on time, you know, we can do the most perfect clinical diagnostic and we can come up with the best treatment, and you're not taking your medication, 
is not going to result in the right outcomes. So if we look for the real drivers of health, we should make sure that we come up with a treatment that fits with you, a treatment where we can help you stick with the plan and have constant feedback that not only helps you in your treatment, it will also help the clinician to better understand patients like you. So we're moving also that capture of information much closer to you. You know, I'm wearing a watch, but this watch is a medical grade device. I have uh, hypertension, this watch, and a connected blood pressure cuff, and a coaching program that interpreter, interprets my data in my context, help me control my condition. So bringing that information to you, giving you the tools to prompt you, to help you, to guide you, to nudge you, will help you get better results. You've seen earlier that we talked about the handheld ultrasound. Now you can say, great, you know, you put something in a small device, you make it portable, you even sell it as a service, I love it, you know, totally sustainable. I can tell you what the impact is on health. If your GP has this ultrasound and you wake up and you have chest pains and heart beating, you can go to your GP, he can do an ultrasound of your heart and he can press the triage button. Now what's the triage button? There and then a cardiologist can watch over his shoulder and jointly they can create the right diagnostic and treatment plan for you. Today what happens is you get diagnosed, the, the GP says, hey, I don't trust it, you should do an ultrasound, make an appointment at the hospital, ultrasound is done, then you make an appointment with a cardiologist before you know four or five weeks have passed. Now we do it here and now. There is huge value to here and now. There's huge value to being mission critical in healthcare. And I worked on mission critical systems in the financial world where a second or even a split second can uh, make the difference between losing your shirt or becoming very rich. I think here a split second can make the difference between being alive and being dead. So healthcare has to become mission critical and it has to move to the point of care. We need to give people the tools to self-management. We need to give them the education to help them control themselves. But we also should give them 24 access to a team of experts. And I think that is what we're trying to do together. What we're trying to do together is not just focus on this illness diagnosis and the right treatment plan, it's actually preventing it. If you had a stroke once, the probability of you having another stroke is extremely high. So what can we do to avoid it? What tools can we give you to manage? And what early indications we can see? If you have heart failure, as do 400 million people around the world, if we can give you the watch and early signs, we can actually avoid a cardiac arrest. So today in the hospital, we stream the data of patients. We compare that with their history and from that we can have early indicators. We can see 24 hours in advance a heightened risk of cardiac arrest. And then six hours in advance, we suddenly see a huge jump, which means that we have a six hour window to avoid a cardiac arrest. If we wait another six hours, you know, it may be fatal or it may be very high cost. The same applies to stroke. If you look at the graph between the cost of care and the passage of time, the earlier we can deal with a stroke, the better the outcomes and the lower the cost. So there's a direct relationship between time and cost. So if we can bend that curve, we not only create better outcomes for patients, we actually help the system. And if somebody's undergoing treatment, it's really about helping them transition to the care system. If you're in Rothbard Hospital and you, you, you're supported by their world-class care, the moment you go out of the hospital, you should stay teetered to the hospital, specifically if you are still high risk. But we can monitor wherever you are. We can help you whenever something happens. You know, better still, we will call you when we see something happening instead of you calling Rothbard. And Lucien, of course, is driving towards that model of care. But we have the technology today that can actually deploy these models. But it requires a different way to reimburse it. It, 
requires a different way to collaborate. So that's why we're not just talking about technology. We're not even just talking about processes and workflow or not just w talking about reimbursement. We're talking about truly getting together, truly empowering patients and engaging the full care team. And this is a picture of my daughter who has type 1 diabetes who's been working with K. Stock from Rothbaut on truly working together to improve the outcomes for type 1 diabetes patients in a collaborative care team and not eight or nine different disciplines working in silos, eight or nine disciplines working together in a team that's there for their patients. So let me recap what I touched upon. You know, it's technology, it's process reimbursement, but more importantly, it's really about collaborating around people, truly human-centric approaches to care. It's about new models where we identify the real needs of patients and organize around that. It starts and ends with us, consumers that are patients. It's supporting an open infrastructure where everybody can connect, where we can, like we connect a point of sale device that allows us to pay, we can connect a healthcare device that allows us to get a better view of a patient and help them with the care they needed. We have to share information. So we have to do shared research, but we have to have these eight or nine stakeholders collaborate to watch these patients. And lastly, we have to be able to accumulate the data, aggregate that data, so that every engagement between a patient and a caregiver adds to the body of knowledge and we can fine tune every day, get better and better at the care for patients, at the care for people like us, our friends and family and our neighbors. Thank you. Well, you know, you talked also a lot about uh, um, hospital to home. Uh, in our current thinking, uh, there's uh, fr from hospital to home, but also to phone. Actually. Yep. Uh, I, I know you're just like me, addicted to our smartphones uh, and, and the connection that goes with it. Uh, what's your strategy as Philips to more empower the phone? Like you earlier said, it's, it's in one of your talks, it's a hub. Yep. It's something that's like 24 hours at, at elbow distance completely charged, everything up and running. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I, I said before that I think the, the smartphone is probably the best medical device ever invented. And there's a reason, because it allows us not only to learn much more about you as a consumer and as a patient, give us much more contextual information, but it also allows us to collaborate much better with you. So. You know, in my world, I think a doctor will not only pres prescribe medication, they may also start prescribing meditation, mm -hmm. and they may start prescribing apps, mm -hmm. because all of these are, are becoming really relevant in the way we control our health. You know, the major health drivers are social, our, our education, our friends and family, our behaviors, you know, do we smoke or don't smoke? You know, what's the best way to eat? What's the best way to exercise? How do I sleep well? And how do I make that information relevant for me, but also for my care team? So, and the hub is gonna be this device and stuff around it, which can be wearables. You know, you talk about insidables. Stuff is gonna be in your body. It's gonna be on your body. It's gonna be around your body. And all of this will build up to that profile, that, that picture of you, that we need to better care for you. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, Martin, uh, Jeroen talked a bunch of technology, addressed all of that. And like you said earlier on, it's my challenge to, to, to speed up the process, to really get it up and running. And, and also to, from also startup mentality, get it more into the scale up kind of thing. Um, one of the things Jeroen uh, shared with us is the way that the, the, the banking industry used uh, the standardization as well as a tool to get things really connected and, and spread it out, which is also one of the challenges that I know that you have also with the eHealth Week just in front of us. Um, could, could you share about the, the need of standardization as such and how you want like, to use that actually as a, a tool to, uh, to speed up the processes? Well, I think standardization is a very vital issue uh, because it's maybe uh, one of the leading driving forces to speed up innovation. 
Uh, if you look at healthcare, I think, uh, well, I'm exaggerating a bit, but I think that every hospital has its own ICT systems, has its own things, has its own I thought you were exaggerating. <laughs> uh, well, I see I'm not. <laughs> uh, and therefore, uh, standardization could help, at least help to have uh, some kind of same architecture in for, for the future. So I think standardization is very important, but also, uh, of course, open source data. Uh, so in thinking about uh, promoting e-health, you have to think about standardization and uh, uniform uh, uh, models. I think that's one of the things um, people who pay for healthcare could ask or could demand or could uh, say, well, I'm only financed it um, if you uh, uh, subscribe to that kind of standards. It's not the way we think yet, but I think we are going to think that way uh, in the future. In one of the commission meetings that we were in, I, I, I suggested why not keep like 5% of the payment hostage up until the moment time when you really do adhere indeed to these, uh, to these um, uh, standardizations. And maybe that would be an idea because once the money is not getting into the right flow, I really do think that that's also the moment time when we ah, people yeah. really step into yeah. it. It's a very interesting proposal from all the hospitals, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank, <laughs> you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if he speaks on behalf of his organization. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not. No, but, but, but I, I think it's <laughs> critical that, you know, if we really want to leverage all the opportunity we have, it's not only that we have to standardize, but we also have to open up. You know, uh, you know I, ICT vendors cannot lock up the data and hold it, uh, hold it hostage, including us. So I, I keep asking our customer, if you ever feel that we're holding up data, you have to tell me because I think it's in the interest of healthcare that we, that we expose the data, that we give patients access to the data. Now, sometimes you have to wrap that up in a way they can understand it, but at least they should become owner of their own data. My, my daughter tells me that she is the data aggregator and she's not really good at it. She says every time I see one of the disciplines in healthcare, I have to tell my story again, I have to fill in forms again, and uh, then I get some uh, observation or some recommendation or some treatment plan. So I have to integrate the different plans and, you know, I, th I think that's not of this time. We're in 2016, you know, the world has moved on and it, it, it's actually a shame that we're not in a place where this is natural. It's true, but, but of course there are uh, privacy issues, especially when it uh, concerns data around healthcare. So people are sometimes people are hesitating about that. And I think the future will be that we want to use uh, big data, but this data should be uh, owned by the people themselves. Yeah. So I think that's a solution and the way out yeah. of and this the, privacy and issue. And yeah. then they can decide themselves whether sure. they want to put sure. it in the cloud or not. As interesting, because I personally believe the cloud is, uh, you can do this very secure. So security and privacy are separate issues. So let's assume we can do it in a secure way. Then it's privacy is really about how much do I want to share. And it's interesting that some people say, I want to share it all if you de-identify it. Or other people say, I want to share it when I drop down and open up the floodgates. <laughs> and here's all the data if you can help me treat you.